is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering One Piece, season whatever, episodes 44 and 45. In these episodes, well, that moment where where Nami decides to leave the island got me pretty teary-eyed, guys. I'm not going to lie to you. It was a really good ending. I loved it so much. And now, Luffy is famous, and he is so delighted. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Bernadette for commissioning this episode. Bernadette is here in the chat. What's up, girl? Um, so yeah, these episodes I really, really enjoyed. It's a lot of sort of hearkening back because we do cycle through all of the old villains to let them know that they, to let us know that they have been let know about Luffy. Um, and honestly, that the second episode of these two will probably be pretty short to talk about because it's there's not a whole lot plot wise. There's just a lot of setup. Um, there's you know the, the the little bit of plot where we have a, a little fight between two ships, but then everybody just jumps overboard. So I don't know. It doesn't really add up to much. Um, but the first of these two is really, really fun. And I really enjoyed it. And it like really touched me a bit, you know? So I often wonder, <laughs> and if Gabriella is here, I'm, I'm interested to, yeah, Gabriella is here. She's the first one to comment it. Um, so <laughs> I often wonder about Things that I don't react to the way that people want me to react to them or are expecting. And this happens sometimes. It's unavoidable. You know, I will have just not that much of a response to an episode of television or chapters of a book that people expect more from. Or they'll think I'm going to get mad about something and I don't actually. That was something that happened with uh, reading Ready Player One. And it's one of those things where like all of the criticism levied at Le Ready Player One is absolutely 100% correct, but I loved that book anyway. And I think everybody listened to the episode that I did covering it, expecting me to tear it apart and sort of looking forward to it. And then I just didn't. And they were like, well, what the fuck? The whole thing with what went down with uh, Belmare, I think... I might have been a disappointment in the fact that I wasn't as upset so much as I was baffled at the choices made and irritated because it just felt really unnecessary to me. Um, but in, in this episode, I feel like everything with Belmare came around in a way that I really, really liked and I thought was really sweet. And I also appreciated, you know, I've, I've talked about this show being fairly slow paced and that can be frustrating sometimes, but then there's stuff like this that I actually, it, it works really well because it gives these characters room, you know, um, it's sort of weird because they can be a little bit inconsistent in where they decide to place the time that they're spending. So sometimes they will rush through one thing. And then drag out something else that I don't feel deserved it at all. But in terms of Nami's story, I feel like they have really taken their time in a way that I appreciate, that I feel Nami deserves as a character, that I feel really set everything up in a satisfying way, and also gave us such emotional like stakes regarding how it all worked out and made the this like goodbye a lot more effective. Um <laughs> Gabriella says, after the Doctor Who podcast, I've embraced your style. Yeah, y'all, Doctor Who was was full of those expectations. And uh, I think really the, the 
<laughs> the emotion I brought most was just sheer rage. I was angry at that show all the time. Um, but yeah, this goodbye, I feel like I have seen the episode of somebody saying goodbye to their past and their history as they move on to a new phase in their life, a literal new location, all of that. And honestly, it's one of those things that usually fails to hit for me because I am somebody who has just never felt any hesitation about picking up and moving. I've lived all kinds of different places. I was very eager to leave home and like most of you know, I applied for like a boarding school when I was still in high school so that I could get away. I have never been somebody who gets tied to a place. And I have always my family has lived all over. So it has never really felt like leaving any place has been leaving my family any more than anywhere else. So those kinds of storylines tend to not hit for me because it's difficult for me to relate personally. But what I love about this with Nami is that it's not about her physically leaving. Nami has left. She has traveled all over the place. She has been everywhere. But she always comes back because she has been emotionally tied. And so it's much less about the physical change than it is about the lifting of a burden and also a feeling of complicated emotion around that where you're glad that things are over. You're relieved that you don't need to keep working towards this thing anymore. And yet you feel almost guilty turning your back on it, even though it's perfectly acceptable. There's still a part of you that's like latched on that, especially she started doing what she did to try and save the town eight years ago. That's a very formative time in your life. And I can imagine being the kind of person that she had to become in order to accomplish saving as much money as she did, uh, that it might be a difficult thing to turn off again, you know? And we do see like a shadow of that later when she's talking about how much money she wants to be able to make. And Usopp is just kind of like, what does it matter? You don't have to buy your town back. And she's like, I would like to be able to buy clothes. Um, I feel like if you have the kind of compulsion that would come from earning money to save people, just because those people no longer need saving doesn't really mean that you can turn that compulsion off again. It's sort of the same thing that happens when you lived in poverty as a kid and you just are used to not wasting stuff. And as an adult, you hold on to things and you maybe hoard a little bit and you're perhaps a bit of a cheapskate about some stuff simply because even though that is behind you, it made such an impression on your psyche that there is no getting away from it. So I am really pleased at how much impact her leaving made because of the awareness that everybody in her community has of what she did for them. And the scene where she is wondering whether Belmare would approve or not, I really enjoyed this so much, you guys. She First, there's like two scenes. The first is when she is at Belmare's grave. And she's sitting there, but she's smiling, you know, thinking how she finally succeeded in this thing. And Gensan is... She, him and Nojiko are standing behind her and she says something about how, do you think Belmare would approve of me becoming a pirate? And Gensan is like, she absolutely would not. Are you kidding me? She hated pirates. There's no way. And then Nojiko is like, but would you have listened to her? Like, it's not really about what she would have approved of, because that never really was a massive priority for you, if you'll remember. And uh, Nami has to, like, give her a little bit of a wink and be like, okay, fair. And then Gensan, at first, he's a little offended for, like, an instant. And then immediately he starts cracking up and is like, oh, my God, you really are her kids. And I couldn't help but laugh, too, because, like, even if Belmare was part of the Marines and she 
fought against pirates. She also just didn't really care that much about stealing. And that's primarily what they're going to be getting up to. They're not going to be landing and, you know, sacking towns and, and killing people. They're going to be stealing is their primary objective. And I feel like if Belmare knew the kind of person that Luffy is, she she would definitely 100% be like, oh, yeah, this is fine. No. Go ahead. Which we get confirmation of later in a scene that I thought was the sweetest. I loved this so much. So let me let me back up a little bit here. Um, we have, first of all, the, this huge celebration because everybody is it, – it's like it goes on for days, this uh, relief at the fact that they are finally free from Arlong. And I love that there's like an overhead shot of the town at one point and they're having a block party. There are all these long tables and all of this food. And Luffy is in his element. I mean, y'all know. We see all of these people dancing and celebrating. And this is the kind of thing that I I think was maybe what was sort of missing from some of the other arcs is we don't get to see the aftermath of people that much, like in, in that much detail. I really enjoyed seeing that here, getting to watch a community that has been under the thumb of a monster, a literal monster for eight years. I mean, that's a hard that's a hard thing to imagine and i don't think that any of the other communities that we have seen them sort of uh go in and save have been under anybody's thumb for quite that length of time maybe i'm wrong about that but i feel like 8 years is the longest that we've seen um other than maybe uh what's his face baron underbite uh florian Florian's mentioning Trump because of eight years. Don't Florian. He's running for reelection anyway. Don't, don't, don't even, don't even do it. Don't even say it. Don't even think it. Don't even breathe it. Don't even put it out into the universe in any form at all. Never again. Don't do it. I, I just can't. We can't. We can't. We can't. We can't. We can't. We can't. Okay. Sorry. I had a little bit of a like meltdown there, but. Oh my God, just the thought. Um, but so getting to watch everybody celebrate after, this is the thing that I really live for in any story where uh, there's an injustice that's been occurring and it's like a repeating thing or it's a, a something that like, uh, you know, a crime that was committed years ago that's never been solved. I'm listening to um, the Sue Grafton alphabet series. Um, those of you who don't know this, that those are the mysteries that are like A is for alibi, B is for burglar, all of those. And uh, while I do love them, there's the one thing about them that I find a little frustrating, although she tends sometimes to like deal with it in the next book. But she will like end a novel after somebody's gotten away with murder for like two decades, you know, and then... It, it, th there'll be like a, a showdown and she captures the guy and a page later, the book's over and there's no time to enjoy the fact that she won. There's no time to step back and like watch all of the people who have been wronged by this person get the news that they've finally been caught. There's no satisfaction of finding out that the people who told her she was never going to find the guy, or, like getting to see them proven wrong. There's no aftermath. And I love the aftermath and shit like that. That's what I'm always most interested in. The actual events, while very interesting, and that is why so many books are set during that time. For me, as a person who is very interested in the like, psychology of people, I find what, what they do after the crisis is over just as compelling because that can determine whether or not we repeat the same mistakes. It can determine all kinds of things and, and shit can go left even after a crime has been allegedly solved in a way that you wouldn't expect. So we're getting so much time to sit back 
and enjoy this moment of, of victory in and rest and really recuperate with everybody in a way that I wasn't expecting because everything so far has been bam, 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 bam. We leave one place, we go to another and we get whatever break we get on the boat. You know, it's never really like we're going to sit back and, and chill on the beach here at this town. It's always like, oh, we, we escaped with our lives. Get on the ship and get out kind of thing. Um, and I really, it was a refreshing change to get all of this time, especially considering that it looks like we are beginning a new phase. The phase that I'm going to call <laughs> famous Luffy, which is he has been flying under the radar and now that is at an end and everybody is, is finding out about him and he has been able to sort of step in and people have been like, who's this guy? Not really looking like that's going to be possible for him unless he really books it up out of East Blue and gets to a new whole area because all of East Blue knows who he is now and they're going to be actively looking for him. He's not going to stumble into adventure or I shouldn't say that he definitely will, but that isn't going to be necessarily how it has to play out anymore. There's a whole new option open now that people are going to be chasing him. Um, so this party, before we get onto the, the road again, um, we get to see Nojiko just chilling and drinking a beer. And this little kid, Chabo, comes up, the one whose dad was killed. And he is so excited to see the guy who beat Arlong. And I love this so much. Fucking Luffy, guys. Luffy is chowing down at such a rate that he swallows a plate whole and very nearly strangles to death on the plate. And Chabo's like, that's, are you sure that's the guy? Really? And I love this. I was expecting that somebody was going to like help Luffy basically do the Heimlich maneuver on him. Not so. He just manages to swallow the plate too. And eventually he just gets it down and that's fine. And it's all set. I love this. Um, and the, the whole like energy here with him and Nojiko, she actually, I was kind of surprised at the uh, way that she talks to him a little bit later. She says something like, um, I thought you'd be more down in the dumps. Like, why didn't this happen before my dad died? And he says, that's how I felt at first. But now I'm thinking about the future. And I was surprised that she didn't, that she, it felt like, I don't know. It, I was like, it felt a little harsh to me, but I, maybe that's just a show like, reacting to the the way that they think maybe the audience would expect this kid to respond. Um, but Chabo says, we've been saved by that straw hat guy and his friends, but starting tomorrow, we have to start from scratch on our own. And there's no way we can forget what's happened in the past. And I don't think we need to. But what's most important is what happens from now on. What we do now, what things we need to do. We're the ones who are going to support the villages now. So I decided to think that way instead. And I love her. She grabs him by the cheek. Guys. Have you ever had your cheek pinched by an auntie? Because I have. And I hated it so much as a little kid. Oh my God. It was always the Spanish side. Always my dad's side. And he would want me to come in and like see my aunts and stuff for a party. And I would always just be like, I don't want to go in there because you guys can see, even as an adult, I've got chubby cheeks. Even when I was thin, I had chubby cheeks. They never went away. As a little kid, forget it. My cheeks were ridiculous. Like genuinely, you would see my face and go, oh my God, look at her cheeks. So they were just these like big, ripe fucking tangerines on my face tangerines isn't right apples something 
And I don't blame my aunts for pinching them, but it hurts so bad. They squeeze too hard. It's got to me. So anyway, I just like that attitude, though. And this little kid is giving me very strong, like, Nami vibes there. Uh, I love when she's just like, oh, I thought that you were, uh, I was going to get to harass you a little bit more. And he calls her a stupid punk girl. And she just says, punk will do just fine. We cut from there to Nami getting her tattoo removed. And she's still going to have a scar. And she's thinking about how silly it was for her to do this because she knew that they basically stay on for life. You can like kind of get them removed and flashes back to a memory and all of this stuff, guys, Gabriella trying to play all cool. He just has a pinwheel because it's cool. That's all. You lying liar. Oh, just because it's cool. Everybody knows that a pinwheel is so cool. Mm -hmm. I see you. I see you lying straight to my face. None of you can be trusted. But she is crying about having this tattoo and feeling branded and being ashamed of people being able to see it. And then she comes home at one point and Nojiko has gotten a tattoo of her own and just said when she's like what is that Nojiko says oh you mean this it's no big deal it's just a decoration now me and you are the same and Nami is just really touched by her doing that and I was just like yeah honestly that is super sweet and as we find out later Gensan's uh pinwheel is because his face was so scary <laughs> that Nami never like laughed when he would try and like, you know, come over and be like, goo -choo, goo -choo, goo. she would start crying. And Belmer told him it was because his face was too ugly and scary. So he got a pinwheel on his hat, hoping that that would entertain her. And it worked. And uh, from the way that that scene and not that scene, but later on when she leaves, she stole the pinwheel, right? Did she take it? I think she did. Um, but Gabriella says no. Oh, really? Because Nojiko asks... Oh, he left it at the gravestone. Right. Thank you. Um, I was a little bit hoping <laughs> that she had taken it and that Luffy would be so excited and like weirdly attach that to the straw hat because that would not look good at all together, but it would honestly be very funny. Luffy's hat is already an odd bit and having that fucking pinwheel sticking up out of it would just be inexplicable. I really feel like that would throw his enemies off really well. I don't know. I think it'd be effective. Um, but yeah, so let's see. Uh, oh, right. He goes and, and uh, pours one out and he's met remembering everything that went down with Belmare. Uh, we're going to live life to its fullest from now on. We've lost and sacrificed far too much, which is why we're going to smile as insanely much as possible now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Um, <laughs> my God, I forgot about it. He's having this really like private moment. And then Luffy comes out of the woods carrying all of these pieces of meat, these roasts. Did somebody say that they had like a name for these? Because they're like one of those roasts that you only see in cartoons that that's like not a thing that would really happen. <laughs> um, his, his obsession with these roasts and meat specifically is such a weird thing. Uh, Florian just says meat on a bone. Okay. It's, sh <laughs> it is such a specific thing and how he has two bones sticking out of his mouth at the same time as he's carrying like four. Oh God. This whole moment. He asks a grave. Did someone die? Oh, my deepest conveniences. Deepest concussions. Deepest compliment. 
And Gin sends his deepest condolences and he just says, that. Um, guys, so I know a lot of you have told me, and I think I've mentioned this before, you know, you want me to do the subtitles. And I totally am still doing that. Don't get me wrong. Not not wanting to like mm, change that at all. But I will say something about Luffy's character didn't quite totally click for me until I watched the the American or the English dub. Once I watched the dub and I understood the tone a little bit better in the way that certain of his lines are delivered. All of a sudden I understood how much more like utterly clueless he is all the time. It's difficult with the subtitles. You can understand in combination with the expression of the animation and to a point with the like inflection to a point you can get what they're doing. But I feel like Luffy's voice is so odd and he speaks so quickly that I, it was just not quite hitting. I felt like I got a much better feel for everybody else. And he is so erratic and, and just like I said, speak so quickly that it was like, I couldn't get the rhythm of him very well. Now that I have watched the, uh, the English dub with Owen, cause we've gone back and started over. I just appreciate a lot more what uh, he, he's basically like <laughs> in a crew. There always has to be one whenever you do this kind of thing. But Luffy's the stupid one. Like, he's not, not real, but like, he is. He's, I didn't really get that about him. And I don't, like, I said before about how he is definitely ADD, and I stand by that 100%. But I feel like I didn't really understand the energy behind that as well. And now I understand so much more from the way that they delivered those lines. He is just fucking clueless and doesn't seem to like cotton on to other people's mood. Like he doesn't know how to read the room at all, has no interest in doing that. And it took me just a while to understand how totally off in his own world he is to a degree that does make him look like he's actually stupid, which I'm not, he, I don't think he actually is not really. But all like there's a there's he's he's dancing that line for me, you know. Um, but anyway, so yeah, this uh, whole bit is when Gensan is like, you know, Nami's going to be going away with you. Um, she's definitely going to become a pirate, and it's going to be dangerous, and there's no way around that. But if you guys ever do anything to take away her smile, I will come and kill you. <laughs> and Luffy just says, yeah, I'm not going to do that, though. <laughs> and he turns around and basically, like, yells at him. So then we go back to the town. And I think this is supposed to be, like, day three of the partying. But, guys, Usopp is singing songs about himself. 386 is the song that he is on. I love this so much about what a coward he is. And yet he like is, in, is totally prepared to take the credit at all times. You know what? Why not? Go ahead. It's not like Luffy cares. You know, that's one of, one of the things about him is like Luffy definitely wants to be captain. He will fight Usopp over that. But when it comes to like who beat Arlong, if Usopp just goes around saying I beat Arlong... I really think that Luffy would just be like, nah. I don't like if if it came down to it, Luffy would be like, well, you didn't do that. I did that. But only as like a, a bit of conversation. I don't think there would be any heat to it. I don't think he actually cares. His ego isn't tied up in it like that. It would just be like, that's not, I don't remember it like that. And then he would just move right along. Because I think with Luffy, he is so always in the moment that as far as he's concerned, I mean, you can claim that you did. 
you're not going to be able to back that up, but I can, and I can continue to do that. So claim what you want, I guess. And honestly, I wish I was more like that. My ego gets too tied up in shit, man. It's too, it's bad. I want to not care as much as I, this is like the shit that gets me. (laughs) I over explain things sometimes I've realized in my life because I am so desperate to ensure that I am understood and that a person like will see my point of view. And it doesn't matter if they see my point of view. This person is nothing in the grand scheme of my life. And yet I get fixated on how they don't believe me. Even like, you know, um, I just, I, I think about this all the time, especially since I started watching this and it has thrown into stark relief how Luffy can, Luffy can be the protagonist and the fighter and yet not really seem to care that much about that. Everything is in service of the one piece in service of reaching this other goal, but he is making this reputation for himself that is to a point, not really relevant. He is excited about being, what is it? 30 million berries they have on his head because he wants to be king of the pirates. And as far as he's concerned, that's his, that's his first step, but it's not about his reputation in the abstract if that makes sense. So I've just been really noticing in myself lately, this urge I have to always like, feel like people are on my side and get where I'm coming from and see things from my point of view. And it doesn't serve me at all times. There are some times where that's a great communication strategy. And it works in my favor. And I do think that like people will listen and understand better due to that. But then there's things like I am awake at night still because I had one of the worst makeup tests that cost me all this money that I couldn't get back because somebody kind of, I can't tell if they scammed me or if they just straight up did a bad job. And I went into this like long text conversation and tried to like get them to see my point of view and then shared that conversation with another potential makeup artist because I was trying to get them to understand what happened and why I like where I was coming from on what just happened to me. And they turned down the job because the conversation made me look so difficult. And I was just like, all I want is for you to get what I mean. I'm not trying to be difficult. I, this all happened because I tried too hard not to be difficult. (sighs) It's all ego. I just want to like be like Luffy. You know, I just want to be able to just like be in my life and just do what I want to do and focus on that solely and not care about all the extra shit. And I don't know how to do it, guys. How do you do that? I wish because it's not like anybody seems to really fault him for it. They get it as long because they're his friends. And I think maybe that's what it is, is that you have to surround yourself with people who know who, how you are and will just like trust you and then be satisfied that those people get it, even if everybody else doesn't. And I think that's where I I mess up is that I want everybody to get me not gonna happen. It's just not. So I need to be more like him and have like a crew that I'm just like, y'all know, though, and just leave it at that. You know, I'll come to y'all and be like, yeah, but you get me. And then I can just move on with my life and not be awake at three o'clock in the morning thinking about how a makeup artist that I'll never see again hates me. (laughs) That's all I'm saying. Um, so anyway, everybody is asleep in the street, uh, drunk, and Nami is gathering up all of her stuff, getting ready to leave. And this is the moment she sits down for a second, just sort of like thinking about this big step that she is about to take and looking all over the house at the various things that are part of her history, you know? Um, and this picture with Belmare and it's just really sweet. She makes this feast in this flashback and says, today is the anniversary of the day that I first met you two, the day that you two became my daughters. And then there's another moment where she's saying, come on, stop 
Stop crying. A storm destroyed the orchard. So what? You need to be strong girls who can smile even during hard times. Do that and then nice things will come to you. And she's comforting them and they're all like teary eyed and covered in like dirt and dust and whatnot. Um, and then just like small things turning around. Nami, could you get me the salt? I loved that that was included. It's nothing. But that's how memories work of people that you love and that you care about. You'll remember just a moment that's really like in an objective sense, not meaningful, but in a subjective sense, very meaningful. And I, I have those sorts of flashes, you know, of memory with my dad all the time. Um, and then talking with her about like drawing all these maps and studying navigation and how about proud Belmare was of her. Um, I love this like huge sack that she has here that she's like left the note on. This is all of the treasure that she saved up, right? Like that she's basically leaving to the town. Cause I don't feel like they, they don't, I'm looking at it. I was thinking she leaves a note on it, but the subtitles don't translate the note. And it wasn't until like later when she's leaving that somebody yells about how she left all the money and they're like mad about it because they don't think she should have. And I was, I got confused for a second. Then I was like, oh, right. I didn't see what the note said, but that must be what that was. Um, and this is, she has this like moment of standing in the kitchen and she turns around and it's like Belmare is sitting at the table looking at her and she's telling her it's over it took eight years but i'm finally free you said that you know if we smile and and just get through it it would be okay and you were right and i'm thinking about leaving the island i drew charts for eight years for these guys but now i'm going to do it for me and with my friends that was my dream and she starts to say, so, so I'm not sure when I'll come back to this island. And Belmare's eyes are closed here in a way that makes her look co totally at peace with it all. And then the camera cuts away and she's gone. And she says, I'm going now. And she goes to the door and steps outside and a hand shoves her. And she turns around and there's nobody there. I'm not crying or crying. It's just really sweet. I liked it. It just means a lot, you know, to feel like somebody is there. And, uh, I've never really had anything like this happen to me, you know, but I have had Cardinals were my dad's favorite bird and I'll have, I've had a couple moments where I've been thinking about him and a Cardinal flew up and it may just be coincidence, but it's always felt to me like it's just him being like, I heard you, you know, Ugh. grief. So irritating guys. It just doesn't go. It just it hangs around waiting. Uh, and you don't want it to go. That's not exactly it either. But I just really like this for her because of her being uncertain and feeling as if she was like abandoning, her, you know, things in a way that it seemed like she had come around and was finally feeling good about it. So it wasn't totally like the uncertainty it had been. But I just love her getting a moment of like real what's the word I want? Confirmation. Um, and the supernatural aspect of it, of just like, was she there? Was she not? Um, so then we have the amazing scene where everybody's on board the ship ready to leave. And of course, Sanji is like, where's Nami? To which I wanted to be like, um, Sanji, you didn't seem to care where Nami was when you were hitting on all those bitches last night, but I guess that's fine. Sanji is not monogamous. 
I guess is what we're saying. Um, and I should also mention that, uh, that Zoro got stitched up and he winds up just sort of like chilling in an alley, watching the party, but not actually participating in it. And one could say he's not participating because he is injured, but I think it's just because that's not how he rolls. And so he just like chills with Sanji who smokes and, and is like, has eaten his fill and then eventually goes to hit on women. Um, and Sanji, when he, when they say like, maybe Nami's not coming, starts this whole thing with uh, Zoro accusing him of hitting on her and whatnot. So then she appears on the crest of the hill and she yells at them to get the boat going, get that ship headed out. And she is running towards the ship and I love getting son. It's like, you have to let us thank you. You have to let us say goodbye. And uh, let me tell you guys, Team Nami on this one. I don't like, look. It's not like I don't want to feel appreciated. But when I do something for somebody, I don't want, I don't, I am uncomfortable with a, a shows of emotion a lot of the time in person. She said after crying on camera. Um, and I don't want thanks sometimes because it can be so uncomfortable. You know, it's just like, I just, I want to know that you're happy and that's it. And I actually had this also, a close friend of mine gave me this like really generous gift the other day. And when I tried to say thank you, she was like, I don't like it when people thank me. So I'm just glad it worked for you. And that's all I need to know. And I was like, oh, man, I relate. So her whole vibe here, Nami just like sprinting through the crowd because she is not interested in that big drawn out goodbye and the thank yous and all that fucking relate. I don't need that. I don't want it. It will be too much. Thanks. But no. So she's sprinting through the crowd. And of course, I thought that's all it is. That's all she's doing is just avoiding these emotional moments. And I don't know how I missed it, guys, because the camera, the animation shows her reaching in people's pockets. But it happened so quickly that it just didn't register for me. I didn't notice it. And she gets onto the ship, literally sprints past Nojiko, which I was like, you didn't even say bye to your sister? Damn. Jumps onto the ship. And then she lifts up her shirt and all of these purses and wallets come pouring out. She fucking, she robbed everybody. And then she lifts up a bill, a dollar bill, and kisses it and waves goodbye to everybody. <laughs> oh my god, I loved this so much. This is so great. Now, fucking uh, Usopp is annoyed. Zoro says, who knows when she'll betray us again? To which I say, Zoro, how dare you? How dare you, sir, suggest that she will betray you? This she was on behalf of her town. Don't you sully her reputation by suggesting that this was just about greed? What? How could you? And then it cuts to Sanji and Luffy. Sanji, who's just delighted that she's decided to join them. And Luffy, who is laughing hysterically and fucking loving every second of it, because of course he would. Um, and they start yelling after her, you lousy sneak thief, you damn brat, come back here, give us back our stuff. It's so good. It's a perfect goodbye. I loved it so much. And uh, Luffy has one moment of remembering Gensan saying, don't forget our promise. And he gives a big thumbs up about 
you know, making sure that she keeps her smile on her face. Um, and I love, we have a moment back on the shore where, uh, Nojiko is just like, oh, my little sister got me. That was actually pretty good. And the doctor hands over this paper. Um, she got another tattoo before she left and it's a tangerine and a pinwheel. And that is when uh, Nojiko asks about what happened to his pinwheel. And he says, I doubt there's any need for it now. And we end the episode with uh, Nami smiling and looking up at the grave up on the top of the cliff. And we see the pinwheel up there. So, yeah, this was a very good episode. I really, really like this one. Um, and then we go into the next episode, which, like I said, I hardly have any time left, but the next episode is really not that heavy on plot. So I don't think it's going to be too big a deal. Um, the way this next one goes is that it's sort of a revisiting of everybody that Luffy has ever pissed off. They managed to find out about him having this price on his head due to a newspaper service that Nami subscribes to from a pelican that flies up. You know what? Why not? Sure. Okay. Um, I really enjoy seeing what everybody does in the downtime on the ship. Also, uh, Usopp here is making those little bombs of, with the uh, Tabasco sauce in them. And he's saying to calm down because, you know, getting this in somebody's eyes will really hurt. And then he gets like startled and it winds up in his eyes and he's screaming. Oh my God. How did I not notice that there's like a tangerine tree on the ship? When did that happen? Uh, how did they do that? Did we see that? He because Sanji did Sanji like make it or is that what is it that's going on here? I I just realized that I don't know how it just like I took it completely for granted when I first watched it and it's only sinking in now. How you know <laughs> how wild this is? Um. Florian says we didn't see it. They took some from Nami's place. They just took some trees. Shit. Whole trees. Okay. I guess why not? I mean, it's a good way to, to fight off scurvy. So <laughs> Zoro's off to the side saying something about how Sanji's letting himself be used. And I was like, I don't think that is what's happening. I think that Sanji's just sort of pitiful and that's his own decision. But, you know, who am I? Um, and this is when the uh, the paper falls out of the newspaper. And everybody freaks out when they see what it says. And then we cut to a series of meetings. Um. I am not going to go into every single solitary group, but we've got, uh, you know, the signs for Arlong, Krieg, and Buggy, and them all talking about like, well, we have a new enemy on the horizon. And then Luffy's face getting pinned up. Uh, we go to the Marines again. And this dude's stepping out, making a, like a huge declaration about how anyone who wants to run away, do so now. This bastion of peace will not tolerate any weakness in this pirate age. The public's weakness and feebleness is not a sin. We have justice. If there is tenacious evil on the sea, then we, the Navy, must drive it away with the utmost force. And this guy has quite a look to him. In the name of absolute justice. And then there's a pretty dope. Huh! 
And the camera like sort of turns and we see the backs of all of these dudes wearing these rad coats flapping with the arms flapping also because apparently they're just draped over their shoulders like they're the godfather. And it's honestly pretty high impact and I really rather liked it. Um, we go back to, uh, uh, what is her name? Kaya? Kaya. And her getting the news, it turns out that she's studying to be a doctor. Which uh, I'm interested in her doing something. That's cool. You know, like, I, you know what? I, miss, I, 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 I phrased that wrong. I am glad they are doing something with her. I wouldn't say I'm interested. That's overstating it. But I'm glad they're doing something. Um, and I love the fact that when this dude shows her the poster of Luffy, she immediately zeroes in on Usopp in the background. His back is to the camera, but he's there. And it's enough for uh, for Sanji later to be very jealous of him, which I enjoyed. Um, and, oh my God, I forgot that we see the little kid that's like, join the Marines. And he is so much taller now. He's grown like three feet. So excited for him. Luffy-san, you're achieving your dream. And he's like swabbing the deck, this poor kid. He's so teeny tiny. Um, and yeah, maybe the next time, but the next time we meet, we may be enemies. And I'm like, mm, I doubt it. You're too soft, dude. You'll cave immediately because you like Luffy too much. So then we have some dude who goes to see the uh, guy that I constantly think of as Baron Underbite. I can't remember what his name is, guys. Who's he with the, with the fucking jaw? Uh, they show him. Oh, that's Kobe was the kid. Thank you, Florian. And Kyle says, Captain Morgan. I can't believe I forgot. Of course. Oh, my God. <laughs> Duh. Um, and he gets a look on his fucking face. And then... Um, we have uh, Captain Kubo. Is that his name? No, Kubo's with the two strings. Kujo? No, that's the dog. You know the one. Um, he is still Captain. Like, somebody calls him Captain when they go to notify him. Kuro. Thank you, Florian. Uh, but he isn't... He's not reacting the way others are. Everybody else is sort of like, oh, let me at him. And he's just sort of like... Hmm. In a much more thoughtful, restrained kind of way. Um, and then we have the uh, the restaurant and the old geezer, Redfoot, uh, seeing the poster and everything and thinking about how Sanji's doing. And then we go to... Uh, What's his face in the the white pinstriped suit? Long body? Is that his name? I can't get over the fact that that's his name. I'm pretty sure that's his name, though, right, guys? This dude, I don't know. First of all, full body. Thank you, Florian. Guys, if we're talking about, like, characters who are bae, it bothers me how bay full body is like he is just really cute and i think it's a combo of the like pale hair color and the sort of tawny complexion that they've given him but he is probably second only to zoro in terms of like overall hotness of characters on this show i think a combo of those looks plus the uh relaxed hair He's got, like, one of the more normal vibes of every character that we've seen. And uh, he has, like, a bit of sunburn across his cheeks, which always is, like, a bit of a thing for me. I like guys who've got a flush, you know, that sort of complexion. Um, and he sees this poster and seizes upon the opportunity. And he... Decides that he's going to go and uh, get into a battle with Luffy. And he goes out there to talk to his men. And when he steps outside, he notices that all of his dudes are really not up to it. 
These are not guys who are fighters. He's been given a shitty boat and a shitty crew to go with it. And as he's standing there contemplating this, Luffy and company just float on by like it's nothing. And he stops and is like, wait, wait, what the fuck? And so I love this so much. He has, he says hard to pour our targets right in front of us. The boat does not appear to move. It just looks like Luffy's ship goes in reverse. How is that? What? Is that what happened? It looks like that's what happened. Uh, let's see. Gabriella says, Bernadette, are we going to let her diss Mihawk like this? Bernadette says, I was just thinking how to phrase that the ranking clearly is one zero two Mihawk three. Okay. Full body. Fine. Uh, Mihawk is too much like a vampire to be hot to me. I'm not a vampire girl. Doesn't, doesn't hit for me, but you know, it's fine. I also don't really like, well, we'll see him. We see him later this episode. So then we'll talk about it real quick. I'm almost out of time anyway. Um, but yeah, they back up and this dude is like, Oh, you forgot about, uh, what I look like, huh? I'm going to get you. And he tries to fire at them and Zoro just literally slices the cannonball in half. And then he tries again and Luffy's watching and says something like, that's not good. And he sets it off and then it backfires because there were a bunch of cracks in the cannon. And he's sort of like just lazing, thinking sad thoughts about his own failure. When he looks up, and he realizes that Sanji is standing right over him. And he's still very scared of Sanji. Who says, you've got some real balls picking a fight during mealtime, tough guy. Sanji, I should mention, is wearing a an apron that has like a fat penguin on it. So... I don't know what that is, but I really enjoy that detail. I don't know. Um, and this dude just reels back and literally abandons ship. They all just jump overboard. And uh, all of them sort of reflect on how that guy was nothing but talk. That's weird. So we jump from there to this island. And I was a little bit taken aback. I thought... Are we, are these the guys who just jumped overboard and they washed up on an island? Is that what's happening here? But apparently not. Is this the island where our plant haired friend was before? Because it's also got that very tall tower in the middle of it. So I couldn't tell if it was like meant to be the same place or if it just doesn't matter. Um, but these guys are scanning the horizon and they see that Mihawk has arrived. Uh, with his weird fucking ship. And he comes up. I, I had forgotten about him wearing this massive sword. Like up against his back like Wonder Woman. Um, and he comes in and says. I have no business with you. Where is your leader? And it's a fucking straw hat. What's his face? Who is delighted with this news about Luffy. And I love when he sees like this poster. He's like, well, I can't let you leave. And it's treated as something that's very sinister. But then the camera like just cuts to later on and they're all just having drinks. And he's like, it's a celebration. My friend's achieving his dream. And there's like ragtime piano music playing in the background and everything. I found this so funny. Yeah, guys, I'm, I don't know if I'll get to know Mihawk more and he'll grow on me, but I'm looking at him right now and I'm sorry, man, but that, that dude has a fucking chin strap. I cannot co-sign him being hotter than full body with a chin strap. I'm sorry. Not happening. Like, that's just, that's a bridge too far for me. I can forgive all kinds of things, but once you get up into that territory and, and, and one can 
maybe argue about the goatee making it not quite a chin strap, but it's just too, it's too 90s douchebag for me. Can't. Um, but anyway, yeah. So he's got the poster and shows it to Shanks. Oh, and also Shanks has still got, you know, he lost his arm. So he says something about how he's not going to fight Shanks when he's only got one arm. Um, but yeah, in that case, Hawkeye, I can't let you leave. But then we cut to all of them celebrating. And um, all of these people back at the town that are rebuilding who are like, oh, Luffy's a wanted man now. Maybe a great pirate will come from this village. Uh, I love everybody being happy about this. But then and this is the original town that Luffy's like first from. Uh, but this old man is just like, why would you be proud of that? And the bartendress that's got the green hair is just like, yeah, but this is his dream. Look it. He looks so happy. So <laughs> we cut back to our guys. We're finally nearing the grand line. It looks like the only way into it is through reverse mountain here. What? Isn't that... Is that a sinkhole? What does that mean? And Zora says, What a pain. Can't we just sail straight into it? Nope. From what the geezer told me, that's the only way boats can enter. And... I... What is... What is... What does any of this mean? Anyway, Luffy interrupts with, I got it. Let's head straight into it. It sounds fun. <laughs> I'd, it'd feel way better going straight into it. And I'm just like, what are we talking about still here, Luffy? And Nami just puts her head in her hands, says, talking to you makes me feel like I'm going for crazy. <laughs> yeah, when you're like Nami, Luffy must be very tiring. Um... So she points out this little island and she's like, there's a, a town here that it's known as the city at the beginning of the end is what Zoro says. I'm pretty sure I've heard that before. And it's a town where Gold Roger, the old king of the pirates, was born and executed. And Luffy is like, oh, shit. Yeah. All right. Then let's go there. Um, and he says, yeah. I want to see it. I want to see the town where the man who got the one piece, everything this world has to offer, was born and then died. And we have one last brief look at the Buggy the Clown chilling on this, like, uh, raft. I don't know how he made a raft. Who knows? You know, he clearly got catapulted into water. I figured he was still alive. And uh, what's her face? With the She is like skinny now, though. It looks like it's the same woman, but she just lost a bunch of weight. I don't know what is going on there, but she's got the same like heart ship. She didn't die, right? Like this isn't a replacement. This is the same one. Well, you guys can't tell me. What am I even asking you for? But yeah, so that's the uh, end of the episode. Um, ooh, Florian says next episode you're allowed to watch the intro. Okay, cool. I will do that. Uh, all right. Well, I have to wrap. I'm over time. Thank you guys very much for hanging out with me and feeding me lines, my character names and whatnot. I appreciate you all. And thank you, Bernadette, for commissioning this. And I'll be seeing you again soon with a new one. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.